Hello. The title of this lecture is The Fundamentals. Biblical Christianity was under attack in the early 20th century. Conservative Protestant clergymen became increasingly alarmed with the progressive development of modern liberal thought and its challenges to the basic tenets of Christianity. Reuben Torrey, and many others warned that an increasing number of liberal clergymen were opposing the claim that every single sentence of the Bible was the word of God. Those who relied on the literal interpretation of scripture believed that American Protestantism built on the foundation of the Bible was crumbling due to the liberal compromise of Christianity with evolutionary science and higher criticism. Conceived to combat the menace of Protestant liberalism, the fundamentals consisted of a 12 volume collection of articles authored by leading conservative evangelicals in the period of 1910 to 1915. The publication of the fundamentals signaled the arrival of the fundamentalist movement. By the end of the world, World War I, the split between liberals and fundamentalists was complete and irreversible. Charles Darwin on the origin of species and the descent of man, two books that had a profound impact on thinking in the late 19th century, and also German higher criticism certainly made its made their mark in on literature, philosophy, social theory, and theology throughout Europe and North America. Within the American religious community, there were two general approaches to evolutionary science. One was the acceptance that Darwinian science was a positive feature that could overthrow outdated orthodox theology, and two, the opposing perspective, which claimed that evolutionary science was incompatible with the word of God and thus a threat to Christianity. Historical criticism, which questioned the authorship and the authenticity of scripture, further exacerbated theological crisis among seminarians. Carried by a modernist wave that began with German scholarship and augmented by Darwinian and social Christianity, most American seminary educators sought to advance theological scholarship, much of which challenged traditional biblical interpretations. For example, faculty members in several leading theological schools found the accounts of the virgin birth to be unconvincing historically. The slide began when theologians rejected the total infallibility of the Bible. The idea that history was determined by a cosmic struggle between the armed forces of God and Satan and that these supernatural powers might directly intervene at any moment became outdated thinking in liberal circles. This was something that was observed by historian George Marsden. In the late 19th century, Dwight L. Moody was representative of those who saw danger, the danger of liberal thinking to the task of soul winning. Another popular evangelist who embraced Moody's revivalism and who lived to see the emergence of a fundamentalist response to liberalism in the 20th century was Reuben Torrey. He is a transitional figure of revivalism and fundamentalism. Torrey was born in New Jersey in 1857. 19 years younger than Moody, he represented the next generation of biblical Christianity. Having a wealthy father enabled Tory 
at the age of 15 to enter Yale College where he took advantage of his freedom and lived a life of pleasure, including drinking. As an 18-year-old college student, he awoke in the middle of the night in a terrible state of agony and despair, seriously contemplating suicide. When he failed to follow through with this plan, he begged God for help. Because of this experience, Tory resolved to obey God and preach even though he, quote, did not know what it meant to accept Christ, end of quote. As it turns out, Tory made little immediate change in his lifestyle. After completing his degree in 1875, Tory entered Yale Theological Seminary where his theology was anything but orthodox. He, had, he adhered to a liberal interpretation of Christianity, doubting whether Christ was the Son of God. His whole Christian foundation was crumbling away. Ordained a Congregationalist minister in 1878, Tory lacked an understanding of preaching and planning techniques for his first congregation. Several years later, he withdrew from his first pastorate to study in Germany. Ironically, it was during his search for theological knowledge in Germany where higher criticism blossomed, that he began to question the liberal views he had acquired at Yale. Tory departed Germany with a determination to preach the inerrancy or literal truth of the Bible rather than liberal theology. His eventual church success paved the road to a position as superintendent of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, a position he held from 1889 to 1908. In addition to these administrative responsibilities, he also pastored at the Moody Church in the years 1894 to 1906. Before he arrived at MBI, Moody had already accepted the literal truth of scripture, the premillennial belief of end times, that that is the millennium or 1000 years of righteousness could only begin with the physical arrival of Christ. And he believed in the full baptism of the Holy Spirit defined when an additional religious experience followed conversion. While at Moody Bible Institute, Tory had a vision that he was to share his ministry to peoples of other nations. Thus the start of a world tour in 1902 that resulted in revival meetings in Japan, China, Australia, New Zealand, Tasmania, India, France, Germany, and Great Britain. At London, he filled the Royal Albert Hall for five months in 1905, a feat few, if any, could match. He also held a major revival, revival campaigns in large cities in the United States and also in Canada at Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal. By 1908, Tory had suspended much of his successful revival activity when he began to teach at the Los Angeles Bible Institute. The revival message of Tory remained orthodox, but the methodology was modern. Successful evangelists understood the importance of making conservative evangelicalism more accommodating to modern popular culture. Tory used theater like tickets and the latest in consumer advertising. Proto fundamentalist evangelists could adapt the forms and technologies of popular culture without accepting its secular substance a strategy successfully employed by 20th century fundamentalists. 
They were hostile or skeptical to scientific theory, but accepted the comforts of technological advances without compunction. They gave mass evangelism a dramatic rebirth in the United States by, com by combining modern technology, persuasion techniques, organization, and advertising, advertising with an evangelical orthodox message. Tory's message was much more clearly a conservative evangelical message than Moody. The offense of liberal modernism, which Moody had treated lightly, was central in the sermons of Tory. Tory's meetings usually open with a musical half hour conducted by Charles Alexander, who made it a point to entice audience members, whether as solists or groups, to sing. Unquestionably, Alexander and his gospel songs played a significant role in recapturing the spirit of an evangelical heritage that remained a core ingredient within the consciousness of many Americans. In describing the Tory Alexander mission, one magazine writer wrote with keen insight that revival meeting songs, quote, all carry recollections of the days when the listeners were younger and doubtless pure and more gentle. The prayers, the appeals, all carry hearers back either to the knee of the mother, to the little meeting house to which they used to go, or to the church in which for many years they were youthful attendants." End of quote. Simple, such simple gospel tunes were expressions of a popular religion that rejected formality and advocated unceremonious worship of God. One identified pastor writing about the inspirational impact of the glory song testified that, quote, when I hear that vast crowd singing those beautiful words, my heart is filled with a great gladness. That one song must have brought thousands to Christ and saved a great army. It's a wonderful hymn, and we shall never forget it. I feel uplift, uplifted by its various echoes. End of quote. Prayer, a collection for expenses, scripture reading, announcements, and then Tory's sermon followed the opening segment of heartfelt singing. Similar to Moody, Tory told the old story of sin and salvation with an emphasis on the Bible, the blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the power of prayer. Condemning personal sins aggressively, Tory spoke out against drinking, dancing, gambling, abortion, mistreatment of the poor. Observers noted that Tory was a teaching evangelist who maintained a, a high standard of biblical exposition. His addresses were masterpieces of logic and every argument was secure with iron bolts of unanswerable gospel truth. Tor Tory's early 20th century sermon suited those who desired a message of sin and salvation from someone who studied and rejected liberal theology. Referring to his blunt condemnation of wrong, one reporter recognized Tory's aggressive manner. Quote, he is more likely as a first expression to arouse mental resentment. And it strikes one sometimes that he deliberately aims at that end. And then with the manly plea, urges a right intellectual attitude and the facing of eternal problems in the light of future consequences and present duty, end of quote. So this here we see kind of foreshadows the tone of 20th century fundamentalists. Ready to, to present um, perhaps unwelcome truths. Though not an eloquent man, 
Tory spoke with power derived from intense earnestness. Quote, he tells the story of the cross in simple language, such that the smallest child present could understand without difficulty, end of quote. Newspaper accounts portrayed him as an earnest evangelist who adopted a direct, no-nonsense, masculine manner of preaching. After his sermons and with astute timing, Tory invited those who wanted to accept Christ to raise from their seats. Next came a prayer from Tory and more singing from the choir under the direction of his musical assistant. During this time, personal workers went among the audience to extend individual invitations to come to the front where penitents signed inquiries cards and as directed by Tory, received encouragement to join a Bible-believing church. They were to avoid churches, quote, where they tear the Bible to pieces, end of quote. Tory and Alexander placed much emphasis on personal testimonies in an open forum. And like Moody, they stressed the importance of the atoning blood of Christ. This frontal attack, this approach clearly was at odds with what would become later known as mainline churches, where soul winning was not the focus. Most Episcopalians failed to endorse Tory, some labeling Tory and Alexander, quote, false teachers. Congregationalists were quite critical, even though Tory was an ordained Congregationalist minister, stating that Tory was the literalist of the literalist. A Congregationalist questioned his unpleasantly narrow message that ostracized, quote, sincere, broad-minded, Christ-loving, and man-loving men of liberal faith, end of quote. Even more reprehensible were that Tory's references to, quote, higher critics represented pandering to the prejudice of the masses who were unfamiliar on the issues of higher criticism. Often the most liberal of his critics were the Unitarians. For example, a Reverend J.B. Hillcock deplored Tory's dogmatic preaching, his attack on higher critics, and his emphasis on the substitutionary theory of the atonement. Most Baptist clergymen were supportive of Tory and Alexander. A common observation was that Tory and Alexander represented the old fashioned gospel and their approach of dealing with the old truth in the old way was done in a fashion that glorified God. Using an analogy of a blacksmith, a Reverend Alex White claimed that Moody wields, quote, a sledgehammer in his attacks on sin, end of quote. Breaking individuals rather than melting them. The Reverend J.D. Freeman used even more violent imagery to describe Tory. As he delivers his propositions, quote, the naked sword of the spirit gleams in his hand. It flashes forth incessantly as he thrusts it into those who now stand accused of high treason to heaven's king. In his hand, it seems to run red with blood. End of quote. Describing the revivalist work and the impact in the Canadian city of Toronto, the Baptist Reverend King wrote, quote, They are fearless and unflinching in their loyalty to the truth. They have been severely criticized, of course. Such men will be. Doubt them when they are not, but the common people heard them gladly. And of quote. And this proto-fundamentalism certainly were was receiving much opposition 
from uh, liberal um, so-called uh, people who were more broad-minded. Despite the popularity of revivalism and its message of fundamental biblical truth, liberal thinking began to take over the leadership positions of Christian institutions. One can see this in, in the churches, the various committees and organizations which would be having liberals uh, in control of most leadership positions. When, quote, liberals abandoned theories of um, the literal interpretation of the Bible, and when they questioned traditional assumptions about biblical authorship and described the Bible as the product of a prolonged historical process, and the quote, conservatives responded. The publication of the fundamentals was a key response to modernism. The fundamentals first uh, appeared in the year 1910, and for a five-year period, there were a uh, many authors who presented a conservative evangelical uh, interpretation of the of Christian life. And in as far as relating to Tory, this uh, was just shortly after he had finished up his revival tour and began his position at what would become known as Biola, the, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Well, as far as the fundamentals, the editorial committee to su supervise the publication included A.C. Dixon, pastor of Moody Church, and he acted as the chairman. Committee members, among others, included Louis Meyer, a Jewish Christian evangelist, Reuben Torrey, and Elmore Harris, president of the Toronto Bible Institute. The Toronto Bible Institute um, later in the late 20th century would become known as Tyn Tyndale and uh, presently 2021 Tyndale University. With the fundamentals, there were 60 four authors who appeared. And the, the breakdown was multi Americans. There were 41 Americans, 11 Englishmen, six Canadians, four Scots, one Irish, and one German. The project that resulted in 90 articles was financed by Lyman Stewart, a Southern California millionaire. Stewart described the group as, quote, the best and most loyal Bible teachers in the world, end of quote. Stewart's money saw approximately 3 million volumes distributed free to pastors, theological professors and students, and other religious leaders in the English-speaking world. The long-term effect of the fundamentals was its symbolism as a point of reference for identifying a fundamentalist movement. Coined in 1920, the term fundamentalist defined, quote, the broad united front of the kind of opposition to modernism that characterized these widely known, if little studied, volumes, end of quote. And while many pastors received these gladly, typically it seems that many of the theologians in seminaries did not um, pay them much heed. They were considered outdated thinking. The fundamentals 
thought credibility and respectability for anti-modernist forces. There was little discussion of the controversial teachings of premillennialism and dispensationalism. There were two articles on each. Many of the early fundamentalists were of Calvinist background. Calvinist thought, quote, nearly always demanded intellectual assent to precisely formulate a statements of religious truth, end quote. Arminian denominations like Methodism had a greater concern for ethical aspects of Christianity and rarely were attracted to the fundamentalist movement. Ethical oriented denominations often altered their theology to keep pace with modernist interpretation. Books published by the early fundamentalists focus on the otherworldly rather than concerns for worldly social development. As was the case with D.L. Moody, the fundamentalists saw the world as a wrecked ship and their task was to save as many occupants as time permitted. Many early fundamentalist leaders became involved with various administrative church positions, yet there is no indication of them adopting a political agenda outside of their church communities. Of course, I should note that the more mainline denominations that were uh, really more showing greater interest in liberal thinking, modern, modernism, there was not, uh, the fundamentalists were certainly not making much inroads with, with those denominations. Much of the administration church positions would be the more evangelical churches and denominations. Most of the early fundamental leaders were born in urban centers located throughout the northeastern states. Many had impressive education. They certainly had not arrived from backwater communities oblivious to liberal and scientific thought. And this was one of the sort of myths that anyone who was taking a literal interpretation of the Bible must be. Uh, not well educated, but certainly this was not the, the case when it came to the early fundamental leaders. Their biblical theology did not start with the Aristotelian method of reason. Many of them favored a Baconian system which first gathers the teachings of the Word of God and then seeks to deduce some general law upon which the facts can be arranged. The inductive scientific method of Francis Bacon, who was a 17th century philosopher, avoided speculative hypotheses. Essential was careful observation and classification of facts. Fundamentalists also favored Scottish common sense realism that, quote, affirmed the ability to apprehend the facts clearly. Linked to Baconian science, common sense philosophy was appealing, quote, because it provided a firm foundation for a scientific approach to reality. The common sense of man was the surest guide to truth. One important strand of fundamentalism was those who upheld dispensationalism. Again, I mentioned earlier that there wasn't too much treatment to this in the fundamentals. But it, what followed in the wake of the fundamentals were a significant number of people who did adopt dispensationalism. In fact, if we look at the uh, articles in the fundamentals, they uh, one third of them were authored by the approximately 19 dispensations who took part in the project. Now, they didn't turn so much to this subject, but they were dispensationalists themselves. Pre-millennial dispensationalism is a complex system that took form in the early 1800s within the Plymouth 
brethren. The key spokesperson was John Nelson Darby, an Englishman who resided in North America off and on from the year 1862 to 1877. Not all premillennialists were dispensationalism, but all dispensationalists were premillennialists. Quote, dispensationalism refers primarily to the division of history into periods of time, end of quote, known as dispensation. The Schofield Reference Bible, for example, identified six dispensations. Innocence, this is referring to the Garden of Eden. Conscience, which was the period from Adam to Noah. Next is human government, Noah to Abraham, followed by promise, which is Abraham to Moses. Next is law, and that is Moses to Christ. Then we have grace. Christ through the present to the judgment of the world. And finally, the kingdom or millennium. Dispensationalists view Bible prophecies concerning the 1000 year kingdom as futuristic. Dispensationalists adopt hermeneutical principles which require, quote, a frozen biblical text in which every word was supported by the same weight of divine authority, end of quote. Historian Ernest Sandine claimed that, quote, when the verbal inspiration of the Bible became a master, uh, a matter of theological dispute, the dispensationalists were able to win many converts to their case by arguing that only dispensationalism really took the Bible seriously, end of quote. Dispensationalism combines an intensely pessimistic view of the world's future with the hope in God's imminent intervention. Dispensationalists, quote, looked for a literal and eminent second coming of Christ as the next event before God judged the world and brought in the next dispensation, the millennium, and therefore referred to their eschatology as premillennialism. In their view, the religious leadership had always been the chief center of apostasy, while the religious remnant has been neglected, overlooked, and even despised, end of quote. When liberal Christian leaders increased their attack on conservative Christians in the immediate years after the publication of the fundamentalist, dispensationalists saw this as evidence of the apostasy of the church. Both dispensationalists and non-dispensationalists who were supportive of the fundamentals believed that they could beat the higher critics at their own game. One of the fundamentalist authors wrote, quote, we do not question for an instant the right of biblical criticism considered in itself. On the contrary, contrary it is necessary for all who use the Bible to be critics in the sense of constantly using their judgment on what is before them. What is called higher criticism is not only a legitimate but necessary method for all Christians, for by its use, we are able to discover the facts and the form of the Old Testament scriptures. Our hesitation, consequently, is not intended to apply to the method but to what is believed to be an illegitimate, unscientific, and unhistorical use of it. In fact, we base our objections to much modern criticism of the Old Testament on what we regard as a proper use 
of a true higher criticism, end of quote. And this is, this is a per perspective that would persist or, throughout the, the 20th century with fundamentalists. And, you know, they're taking the argument that they too are very serious about higher criticism. They want to study the Bible very carefully. They just look at the liberals who have taken a misguided approach, an unhistorical uh, approach, and the consequences of such approach is uh, quite grave. Fundamentalists sought to bring the liberals back into the fold and have them proofread the Bible correctly. And the correct method was to proof text. And this is what Tory wrote, quote, this work is simply an attempt at a careful, unbiased, systematic, thoroughgoing, inductive study and statement of Bible truth. The material contained in the Bible is brought together, carefully scrutinized, and even what is seen to be contained in it stated in the most exact terms possible, end of quote. Tory spoke with confidence for one thing. Fundamentalists noticed that the higher critics kept changing their minds. And, and indeed, this is what one sees in the 20th century. They, keep, they kept pushing their interpretations further and further away from the blood of Christ. As for political issues, those who favored fundamentalist thinking tended to show little interest in any kind of political or social activism. They were politically conservative, but most shunned deep political involvement. There are always exceptions. And evangelist Billy Sunday was one who was very supportive of the war cause when the United States entered World War I in the year 1917. Sunday stated that, quote, if you turn hell upside down, you will find made in Germany stamped on the bottom, end of quote. Premillennialists mostly believe that no trust should be put in kings or government. As a result of their anti-political attitude, they held that political efforts, whether they be pacifist or military, were hopeless in solving world problems. One premillennialist stated, quote, peace and safety is what the world and the apostate Christendom wants to hear, end of quote. World War I, certainly sharpen interest in pro prophetic teaching. And this was worrisome news to liberal Christians. The most vocal and fierce opposition to premillennial views came from liberal scholars teaching at various seminaries. And I might add, it's very difficult to find a professor who is who, ex, who uh, takes a premillennial pre, pre perspective in today's uh, seminaries. George Martin claims that these attacks by modernists represented the first stage of the intense fundamentalist modernist conflict. The line of attack by the liberals was that, quote, premillennialism bred a lack of patriotism and hence was a threat to the national security, end of quote. Much was at stake for the modernists. Opposite of the fundamentalists, they believed that modernism represented spiritual progress. Progress of culture demonstrated the eminence of God and thus the eventual post-millennial realization of the kingdom of God on earth. Many liberals saw the war 
as a struggle for democratic civilization, the German oppressors had to be defeated for there to be continued progress for the kingdom of God. Shirley Jackson Case, professor of church history at the University of Chicago Divinity School, wrote that premillennialism was a dangerous force, quote, as it strikes at the very heart of all democratic ideals by denying human responsibility for the reform and betterment of society, end of quote. Suspecting a signature conspiracy, Mr. Case attempted to link German money to the growth of premillennial ideas. Shaler Matthews, dean of the Chicago Divinity School, likewise published similar attacks. A message found in his journal, The Biblical World, was that, quote, on the home front, the premillennialists were the chief enemy, end of quote. Premillennial pessimism was a serious threat to liberals who founded their religious framework on the belief that human efforts could change the world for the better. During the war, the liberal Christian century published 21 critical articles of premillennialism. The Premillennialists responded with their own criticism of a modernist German link. The King's Business, the leading premillennial journal, stated, quote, while the charge that the money for premillennial propaganda emanates from German responses is ridiculous, the charge that the destructive criticism that rules in Chicago University eminent from German sources is undeniable. And here, the fundamentalists believe they had a good point. Where did higher criticism come from? Where had it blossomed? Well, it had come from German scholars. W. H. Griffith Thomas, premillennial scholar and professor of Old Testament at Whitcliffe College in Toronto, Canada, had argued since the beginning of the war that there was a connection between German theology and German militarism. The argument that corrupt biblical corrupt German biblical scholarship caused the moral collapse of German civilization became an important, important one among rank and file fundamentalists. The consequences could be far reaching. The new theology that was behind the German moral collapse could cause the United States to experience the same demoralization. According to George Martin, the debate that rose out of the war re, re, uh, provided, in essence, a revolution among the fundamentalists. Quote, until World War I, various components of the movement were present, yet collectively they were not sufficient to constitute a full-fledged fundamentalist movement the cultural issue suddenly gave the movement a new dimension, as well as a greater sense of urgency." End of quote. The premillennial journal, Our Hope, went from showing little interest in the war to becoming a major supporter of the war effort. In fundamentalist circles, there was the belief that premillennials had to take greater action against modernism for the good of civilization. But this change in thinking also highlighted a paradox. Premillennialists claimed there was no hope for culture, quote, 
But at the same time, they were traditional evangelicals who urged a return to Christian principles as the only cultural hope, end of quote. It was often difficult for fundamentalists to escape the attention that this paradox represented. To conclude, fundamentalists wanted the modernists to see the error in their ways. And <clears throat> by the end of World War I, the gap that had widened to the point of no return. Many Americans continued to embrace the fundamentals of Christianity, and they viewed the Bible as a fundamental revelation. But liberal scholars took another road. Thank you.